Okay, time for some Q&A. I am now back in Canada, so I have my better microphone now. Hopefully the sound is not so hollow. Let's begin. Uh, I haven't even had a chance to look. Uh, okay, that's just a comment. Some viewers, uh, grateful you opened your eyes to Tesla. Uh, he prays. Okay, that's just a comment. Thanks for doing this, even though you're flying today. Cheers, by the way. Bought your applied series, and holy something, it is good. Uh, well, thank you. That's still just a comment. Questions, questions. Ha happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, it's not really a thing here in Canada, but I'll take it. I hope this isn't too long. I watched the Wall Street bets phenom in 2020 and the zero data expiration tales of losses and some gains and thought I'd like to take the other side of that. Since selling when the theta cone is collapsing the fastest seems to be a good idea. I sell zero data expiration SPX options, usually one strike out of the money, and I defend them with two ES futures. Hmm? Two ES futures at the strike price, long or short, depending on whether I sold calls or puts. So you sell a put, and I guess you'd go short two ES futures. What if, what if the futures... One, okay, this is not making a lot of sense to me. One, you sell one SPX option and defend them with two futures. Ooh, that's risky, I think. Sometimes uh, there's some slippage, but in general, I do well. And I don't want to warehouse risk overnight since it's cash settled at close. Um, that's if, I mean, if you sell the put and ES goes down, sure. But what if it goes up? Two questions. Obviously, it takes a lot of buying power to sell SPX uh, options naked. Is there a way to use uh, BP to generate a return overnight? Um, that's a, such a broad question. I mean, sure. <clears throat> um, but but I guess I'm not following. I guess I get paid to provide liquidity. Sure, okay, to the market. Do you think it would be better rather than going from long short two ES per SPX? Oh, you're selling. Uh, okay, I'm lost. I don't know what it is you're doing. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on this one. I I, I can't follow what it is what you're doing. You're doing the SPX and using ES to hedge, which is <clears throat> so. If it's out of the money, it would have to be forty delta if you're using two ES futures. But I can't get over uh, this idea that, uh, okay, you sell a put and you have two ESs. What if the market really goes up that day, right? Uh, I'm going to pass on this one. I, I, I can't follow what it is you're doing. Do you have any advice to get through 10Ks quicker? Yeah, don't. Why would you want to? Let's say there are 100 pages in a particular 10K. How many pages would you say it takes you to read to determine whether or not you want to take a deeper dive? <clears throat> so I don't read a lot of the risks. They, they go on for like 20 pages, 30 pages sometimes. I read the title of the risk, you know, but I don't read all of the narration around the risk. So you got to read about the business itself. Uh, on, you know, until you get to the risk section, you can really skim over the risk section quickly. Then you get to item seven. I would read item seven because it helps you understand the financial statements. If you're not interested in the company by the time you get to the uh, risk statements, it's not for you. you. You're not seeing the excitement. Or if you get there and you go, okay, I'm not understanding what I'm reading, it's probably not for you. Uh, and then um, the management discussion analysis. <clears throat> you get some outlook there, but it's really a lot of discussion uh, about each, you know, the line items on the statements. I read, I read, um, out of a hundred page 10 K, I'd say I'd end up reading about half the pages. How much do you consider relative valuation when looking at an opportunity? Um, I don't know that I look at it too much. I mean, you, you yeah. Well, I mean, you consider it. I mean, but listen, if you if you see a couple of companies, uh, one at uh, 12 times, one at 12 times, one at 18, there's a reason why it's at 18, 
right? You got to figure out what the reason is. If there's one that's really out there, or if you sign another one at six, there's a reason <clears throat> why it's at six. It's up to you to figure out what that reason is and whether or not you like it. The market's not that inefficient. Um, no, I, I don't know that relative valuation is a big deal because every company is different in some way. Um, I'm not saying I, I don't look at it. I just I just don't know that that has a, a straightforward answer. Sometimes, sometimes not. Much like anything in this market is, you know, do you do this? Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Does this lead to this? Sometimes, sometimes not. It's uh, a complex system. <clears throat> Question regarding an outlook you had previously done. I see your point about why the United States will need low rates. However, once the Fed's essential job is to enact stimulative monetary policy if the economy fails, falls into recession, largely by cutting rates. Yep. They can't do that effectively if the rate is already 0.1%. <clears throat> uh, quantitative easing. easing. So uh, let's just draw it out. And here is money market. Here is capital market. And you can lower rates and all your money market rates will be very, very low. And you may say, well, what if you get a steep curve? Well, then you start buying the 10-year. And you may get something like this. But you force the curve down by buying the 10-year, right? And you force that curve down and maybe you start buying the 30-year to force the long end down if you think the 30-year is stimulative for some reason. But you can just keep buying the curve uh, or buying the bonds, push the curve down. Uh, Howard Marks, don't think it's likely to go back to ultra-low interest rates uh, any, any time. That's if you, um, you know, if you need to, to stimulate. Um, I don't know so much that, that this that it is a uh, purely monetary job. We've seen the fiscal more than willing to step in and stimulate even when you don't need stimulus. So if the economy falls into a recession, I guarantee you, you're going to have a $6 trillion uh, 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 bill, $5 trillion, $6 trillion spending bill <clears throat> being introduced. The fiscal has shown themselves absolutely willing to step in. Uh, Monetary should not be doing all the heavy lifting anyways, right? Uh, so uh, I, I don't know um, if you're thinking about a Fed-only world, then yeah, you don't want to be constrained with the zero line, but there's still quantitative easing, uh, which would do a lot. Uh, but uh, the fiscal, again, has shown itself very willing to do it. ASML down 15% this Tuesday. It's always super volatile after earnings looks cheap now. <clears throat> so I think they, uh, yeah, they're 720, 725. I saw today big drop down, like 150 bucks. Um, there could be more. Um, it's a big deal, right? Uh, for ASML to say what they said and lower guidance. It's a big deal overall because uh, let's put your design firm here. Let's put your fab over here and we'll put your uh, user here and then here is ASML. The user says, hey, we want a lot of chips. Uh, they tell the fab, we need a lot of chips. The fab says, hey, we need more machines. Uh, but when you get to the point where the fab says to ASML, you know what? Uh, we're good. Don't worry about us for a while. We're, we're, we're good. Uh, that means that they have enough capacity. And if they have enough capacity, uh, that means there must be something wrong with demand because every day you have more devices. You have more electric vehicles being made. You have more Internet of Things. You have more smart connected devices. You have more and more and more and more. You need <clears throat> every day more and more and more chips. Just even, even if you're not growing, uh, even if GDP is flat, the proportion of items sold with chips increases. So you'll always need... Uh, equipment. Well, when you uh, suddenly, when the, when the major equipment uh, for lithography, that is, uh, comes out and says, <clears throat> you know what, uh, it's not as good as we thought, and uh, let's lower guidance a little bit. It's like, well, what's going on? It must be, this is still continuing on, so the growth uh, must be really bad. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bigger deal than what you think, because the further 
back you go in the supply channel. Small little jiggles over here ripple into big jiggles down here. Jiggles is a uh, technical economic term, and I'm sticking with that. All right. What implied volatility are you looking at? Uh, implied volatility is always 30 day. If it's one month, uh, they will now include the election premium, which is why it might seem like it's uh, spot. On. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, that would be, uh, it would include the election premium. Okay, there's a good observation. I know I can Google it, but anyways, what this, what, what curvature does? What does it mean? Ignore it. <clears throat> I don't even know why I put it in there. It's a small little thing. Basically, there's your two-year, there's your 10-year, there's a straight line, right? Um, uh, when curves uh, steepen, uh, they usually get curvature uh, in them. So it just, when you look at curvature, it just measures the level uh, of curvature in the curve. Slope measures the level of steepness. Uh, but if you break the yield curve down into factors, <clears throat> levels uh, are about 90% of all return. Slope is about 7% of all return. Curvature plays are about 3%. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really small and insignificant. Uh, if you want to just ignore it altogether, just ignore it. It's, it's not a thing. Uh, <clears throat> make the assumption housing prices are structurally elevated. I don't know what you mean when you say the word structurally elevated. Who do you see as the incremental winners? Incremental winners of what? How would you approach the analysis to prove who on the value chain is receiving the, what value chain? Okay, I don't understand what you mean. <clears throat> when you say housing prices are structurally elevated, um, Okay, I'm going to just translate this in simple English. Housing prices are high. Who are the incremental winners? The incremental winners of what? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. Who are the incremental winners? And what do you mean by incremental winners? Yeah, I, I don't understand the question. Uh, <clears throat> inflation will come down in, in the next months. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if I said the next months, but inflation... In the rate of inflation will, con will, will come down. In other words, disinflation will continue. Sure. What are the factors driving your conviction? Many, 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 many times they've said technology is deflationary. Uh, and it will continue to be deflationary. Is it due to the strike stuff being cleared? No, 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 no. Just <clears throat> the general backdrop of uh, technological progress. TLT is pricing and risks of conflict in the middle. No, no, no. No, TLT is is not pricing in anything. <clears throat> TLT is a portfolio of government bonds. The price of TLT uh, reflects the uh, net asset value of the portfolio that it holds. There is nothing to TLT. If you're looking at the price of TLT, you're looking at the price of government bonds on a per share basis. There's nothing in TLT uh, that is... <clears throat> that 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 is any premium for anything it is just a pass through security really it's just it's like a mutual fund that only care that only holds uh bonds uh us treasuries could you expand on china's gdp impact on commodity prices <clears throat> um Well, I don't know that we'd say it's GDP is uh, impactful for commodity prices. By the time we get GDP, GDP is backwards looking. Uh, so let's say GDP comes in at 6% uh, over a three-month period that has already passed and commodity prices were what they were. If there was any extra demand to create that GDP, it would have already pushed up commodity prices during the period over which the GDP was incurred. <clears throat> so uh, markets are forward looking. Uh, so it would have to be the promise of higher GDP. And it can't just be a country saying we're going to have stronger GDP. It's like, well, how much are you spending to get it? Uh, and so if China says, well, we're going to spend another 10 trillion yuan, uh, uh, yuan, I don't know why I called it yuan, but yuan, um, then the market would say, well, wow, that's, that's a lot. Uh, and it would boost commodity prices in anticipation that there'd be uh, that the demand for commodities would increase 
Uh, but GDP on its own, uh, again, that's backwards looking. I don't think it, it really would do much. What resources would you recommend to use as a proxy for current cost of equity ERP? I have seen Kroll post updated ERPs and they have referred to uh, Demodern's cost of equity model. Yeah, he, I think in his, uh, <clears throat> he has a, a spreadsheet for calculating cost of equity where you drop down a menu, you select a country, and one of the tabs is, is all of the country uh, ERPs. Do you prefer either of these or do you have uh, another recommendation? Look, it's all a guess. One guess is just as good as another guess. Like, just take take an expert's guess, any expert. It's just a guess. It's all just a guess. <clears throat> um, the ERP may be derived statistically, but it is the center of a distribution, right? So that's the whole point of statistics is that you get a point estimate that is the center of a distribution. So you say, ah, there's the ERP. But it has variability, so it's always the center of a distribution with some variability. That's as good a guess as you can make. That's a pretty good guess. 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 As long as you're within 90% confidence interval, they're all good guesses. Anywhere from here to here is a good guess. All of this is a guess. <clears throat> when you do financial modeling, which you have to do to forecast out cash flows, to discount them to the present, it's built on a mountain of assumptions and guesses and shortcuts that you have to worry about being absolutely precise on the ERP. What's the point? Um, take an expert's best guess, right? Don't take something crazy, but I don't think it matters uh, which one you use. I, I, I really don't think it matters. <clears throat> Everyone will be in and around the same neighborhood. They're all looking at the same data. They're all coming to the same conclusion or in around the same conclusion. But just keep in mind that, that everything you do to come up with a valuation is built on at least 40, 50 guesses that you've made along the way to get there. Informed guesses, but guesses nonetheless. There is no such thing as precision. No such thing as precision. It is probabilistic. It's saying, if I take the middle of the distribution on everything, I will be within, you know, uh, one standard deviation 70% of the time of, of the target price. And that's good enough. Uh, so I don't know that I would fret over whose ERP I took. <clears throat> I really don't. Um, whoops. Let's uh, get a new, a new one up there. There we go. Uh, do you prefer either of these? No, not really. Is the 10-year or 20-year U.S. preferred for the risk-free rate and cost of equity calculation? I've seen people use both. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think you can... I don't really think that, that matters much. Uh, in normal times, uh, the yield curve is usually upward sloping, and it tends to look like this. Your capital, uh, your money market rates, and then your two-year sits above. And it... it, it, it you know, climbs to about the 10-year, and then it sort of just flattens out after that. So the 10 to 30-year segment tends to be fairly flat. So take the 10, take the 20. <clears throat> I don't really know that you're going to get uh, a big difference. I would seem to prefer the 10 over the 20 because there's a little strange characteristic in the 20. It's not a very liquid uh, 10 or doesn't have a very big... Um, <clears throat> Uh, clientele effect so you get you get a little bit of a odd odd movement in the 20 so the 10 is all right dividend or risk or got stocks etfs or bonds for the average retire rate um <clears throat> I'd go with the uh, aristocrat stocks because the dividend has a much more favorable tax treatment than the income than the uh, um, than the interest best way to manage liquidity for options to limit data to 0 0.001 when you're starting out uh, when you show yourself that you can manage 0 0.001 in multiple regimes then you can move it to 0 0.002 do you mean it in terms of absolute value what do you mean by absolute value absolute value of what 
Um, the absolute value of what? I I don't understand that. When I have a synthetic or a long put position, the delta dollar is big, but theta is very minimum or negative. Uh, a long put. How can the... Uh, if you're buying a long put, there is no margin. It's whatever it costs you, that's it. You don't need any any margin on that. If your whole portfolio is long options, you'd, you'd never be squeezed out of any position because you have to pay for it. I don't understand that one either. Yeah, I don't understand question one. I don't know what you mean by absolute value. I'm not... What absolute value? Tesla had a short sale restriction on Friday because it dropped 10%. <clears throat> Will uh, there typically be more downward pressure after the short restriction is listed? Or is this a non-factor? It just means you can't short it uh, unless it's an uptick. Like, you know, in other words, if each, if each move on Tesla is down, you can't short it. But why would you need to short it? It's going down. You'd only want to short it for profitability. It's already going down. Shorting's not going to add pressure, but they always bounce. That's where you you hit your shorts is when they when they bounce. They don't just go in one direction. So it's just the uptick rule. <clears throat> How are M two money supply, Fed's balance sheet, and QT? Okay, I'm gonna pass on that. That's a seminar. Where can we check the proportion of debt issuance between short term and long term? U.S. Treasury. Uh, U.S. Treasury. Uh, the Fed doesn't issue debt. <clears throat> the Fed uh, sets rates and, and will buy securities, but it doesn't issue debt. So <clears throat> you'd be with uh, the U.S. Uh, US Treasury for that one. Interest rate risk to your duration position. Well, yeah. Um, duration is the sensitivity in price to changes in interest rates. Duration is the sensitivity <laughs> to changes in rates. So, yeah. It's nothing but interest rate risk. But oil does get attacked in the Middle East. Or OPEC introduced another oil embargo like the 70s do to similar. <clears throat> what, would, what would that have to do with interest rate risk to duration? First part, is there interest rate risk to your duration position? Yes. Second part is meaningless. It's, it's not a conditional. Duration is interest rate risk. Plain and simple. You don't need the conditional. So I, I guess I'm not understanding a lot of these questions today. I, I don't understand this question. I'm not sure what you're asking me. How do you select any stock? I learn it first. Do you use filters? Nope. A lot of stocks. And if you start doing financial modeling for each stock, it'll be very tedious. I don't do financial modeling for each stock. I don't do financial modeling for any stock. <clears throat> I find it to be uh, not a waste of time. Uh, but... Uh, an exercise that um, when you have experience and intuition, yeah, well, let's call it a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Uh, I don't need to to lay out all my assumptions to know that there's a good story here. You know, so I, I start investigating a company and a company will fit into one of three buckets. It's a buy, it's a sell, or it's a hold. Every single company is one of those, period. It either has a great story and you say, this is going up. It's either crap and you say, I wouldn't touch this. Or it's like, eh, I don't know. I mean, I don't see it going down, but I don't see it going up, right? Well, there's always a trade. If it's a buy, you can sell puts. Uh, you can uh, buy calls. You could just buy the stock. If it's a sell, you can sell calls. You could buy put. You can short the stock. If it's a hold, you can sell puts and sell calls. There's always a trade. <clears throat> I, I think financial modeling is good. Like financial modeling, understand, it's the analyst that produces outputs, which then become inputs for the financial model. This is just an Excel, uh, an Excel, uh, 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 you know, hero. Just somebody really good at Excel that takes your assumptions and then builds a model. Waste of time uh, for a retail trader. The analyst to the output, yeah, you're developing your assumptions about how you think the company will perform. But as far as how to model revenue and all that, how to model cost of goods sold in relation to revenue, most of the time the company's giving you guidance. Uh, and the market usually prices out a stock based on one year, one year guidance. 
usually <clears throat> on, on, on a relative basis. A good story is good enough. It's good enough. Uh, financial modeling, I think, is a lot of time spent for very little incremental reward. <clears throat> Most of the time, when I'm when I if if I'm going to do something like this, because it is a long process to do, I'll already know what I want to do well before I I I put the first. Uh, keystroke into Excel, I'll probably already know what I want to do because you got to research the industry and the company first. I'll already know what I want to do. So for me, it, it's kind of a waste of time. Next era pulled back as soon as Hurricane Milton was forced forecast to be a bigger deal than it was. Everything Florida related was being bet against, but then recovered when the hurricane wasn't as bad as thought. I think that's what drove the XLU pullback. Yeah, NEE is uh, the largest component of XLU. XLU holdings in Florida were the ones that got hit. Yep. Uh, when the big banks report earnings, do you dig deep into the reports? Eh, not really. Uh, I, I, I don't buy U.S. banks. Uh, no, it's not my thing. But if, <clears throat> if a company that I am invested in reports earnings, yes, I do. I do. I have a question relating to utilities. You mentioned they would perform well due to being priced like a bond and will benefit as interest rates drop. Mm -hmm. Given that most of the revenue coming from utilities are interest rate linked. No, they're not. No, they are not. Wouldn't the drop in revenue? No, no, no. Offset some of the benefits. No, no, no. That's not how utilities work. <clears throat> uh, the revenue is derived from the level of assets they have. Uh, and so they get a guaranteed return, and the return they get is their weighted average cost of capital, which is a function of the level of debt and the level of uh, equity they have. They're guaranteed to make money. Uh, and, and the growth in their uh, income is related to the growth in their assets because they're regulated. So uh, revenue does not come uh, uh, from... Yeah, the revenue is not coming from anything that's interest rate linked. <clears throat> uh, can you talk a little bit about how you gauge whether or not TLT is undervalued or overvalued? TLT is fairly valued. At any minute of the day, TLT is absolutely fairly valued. It might be a few pennies above net asset value, a few pennies below net asset value, but it is fairly valued. So you cannot ask whether TLT is fairly valued. You have to ask whether U.S. Treasuries at, in the 20 to 30 year segment are fairly valued. TLT is just a portfolio of Treasuries. The price of TLT is nothing more than the price of the Treasuries. There's nothing in TLT. When you look at TLT, you're looking at a share of a portfolio of Treasuries and it is always its net asset value. So TLT is never overvalued or undervalued. Now you can ask, <clears throat> are the treasuries overvalued or undervalued? Well, that's a bigger question to ask because what's your baseline? What's the fundamentals you're looking at? Overvalued compared to what? Right? The bond itself will be a reflection of the yield curve. So the bond is always fairly valued as well. You have to ask, are yields too high or are yields too low? That's all it comes to because the bond is a mathematical consequence of the yield curve and TLT is a mathematical consequence of the bonds it holds. So TLT is always fairly valued. Bonds are always fairly valued. Is the yield curve, the, is it too, uh, the levels too high or too low? <clears throat> well, then that's a big discussion with uh, no right answer. The only right answer is saying, I believe yields are too high and a week later yields are lower. Well, then you were right. That's the only, that's, that's the only thing you can do. Uh, there is no other way to do it. If you say, I believe they're too high and they go higher, well, you're wrong. Uh, you're just wrong. <clears throat> it, is, it is a reflection of whatever the market thinks. And that's what yields, that's what gets priced into yields is the expectation uh, for what I would need if I lent the government money for that period of time. And it can never be wrong because there's always a reason why it would be there. Uh, so it's a harder game to play um, because you can't just look at an income statement and balance sheet and say, well, this is unjustified. 
Hmm. What are your thoughts on TD's bank scandal? Well, we've known it for a long time. We, we've known this for a while. It was expected. Uh, I, I think they'll be under pressure for a while. I don't think you're going to see $90 on TLT for a couple years, maybe. I think you'll float between mid-70s, low-70s, mid to high 70s, maybe low 80s for a while, which gives you a great opportunity to grab a nice dividend and build a bigger position using their own money. <clears throat> After a company reports its earnings, if implied volatility increases, does it make a good entry point for theta trades for income? If it increases, mm, it's usually rare that it increases. Usually it decreases. Where you get the term volatility crushed. Volatility increases into the earnings announcement. <clears throat> and then after earnings, it really decreases. XLU, all-time highs. How would you start creating a long-term position? Buying long-term calls on it? No, not with the interest rates this high. I wouldn't buy long-term calls. I'd probably be selling at the money puts. Regarding your Tesla short selling strategy, would it make sense to buy long term out of the money put options if I expect the stock price to fall? Well, yeah, that is that is what you would do, sure. Uh, markets are pricing in that U.S. Treasury is going to issue longer term bonds in the near future to keep financing its deficits, thus the uptick in longer term yields. No, no, <clears throat> no, no. There is no fear that the U.S. will not pay back its debt. So interest rates will not rise just because of the size of the debt. That never, that never causes anything. No debt crisis was ever created because some, some company or some government had too much debt. The debt crisis is created when everyone believes uh, that they won't get paid back. Then you got a debt crisis. Uh, so no, it was it was just a reflection of the market coming to realize that hey, we're not going to get consecutive fifty basis point cuts. Uh, uh, maybe we're not even going to get twenty five basis point cuts, and the market rethinking the pace at which the Fed was going to cut rates. You've been expecting lower rate environment in the coming years for fiscal fiscal laxity and technological reasons. Yep, Peter Zion ex expects inflation. Growth and rates to go ballistic during the same period for his proverbial demographic reasons. Aging capital owners should move to lower risk assets. High demand for capital to onshore manufacturing. Um, pretty confident that both situations are not mutually exclusive. I have a hard time reconciling these two views considering how far apart they are. <clears throat> the um, older cohort... Um, they don't really buy goods, so we can cross them off the list. They're not buying new furniture. They don't buy new clothes. They're not. They're not uh, uh, buying new vehicles and campers and boats. They're not doing any of that stuff. They're they're in the um, spending phase, not the accumulation phase. Spending peaks around forty five, uh, but they do spend money, right? Which means they move their money into. Uh, uh, bonds or safer assets. However, have a look at the markets. You know, what, what uh, is, is being missed is technology lowers the costs for everybody on everything. On everything. Uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, not just the under 35. So, um, no, I, I mean, if you have an, an aging population, they tend to buy more services uh, then they tend to buy goods. Uh, but services are ripe uh, for technological uh, advancement in terms of uh, what technology can do, uh, what AI can do, what machine learning can do, what pattern matching and algorithms can do. No, <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing it. I don't see it. Uh, if we say capital owners, aging capital owners should move to lower risk assets, we've had an aging population for over a decade now. And um, Bitcoin is 65,000, gold is 27,000. Uh, the S&P is hitting all time highs 25% of the time. You got what, 44 all time highs out of 200 and something trading days? 
you know, that's roughly 25% of the time this year the S&P has been hitting all-time highs. So <laughs> if money's moving out of risk assets, what the hell is pushing them up, right? Um, no, I, I, uh, I, I don't agree with this. I, I don't think um, inflation is going to go ballistic at all. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Phil Peter's analysis seems to only consider first-order effects. What, what Peter has is data and conclusions. I like his data. His conclusions, uh, I, I've said this before, I'm writing very fast, so I'm misspelling. His conclusions are fatalistic. They're a little too fatalistic for me. You know, so the way, and you know, like China's going to have, you know, a shrinking population in a decade. They're not even going to exist. You know, uh, I don't have, he said, come on, a decade. It's going to take a lot longer than that, and they are going to exist in a decade. I like his data. His conclusions are a little too fatalistic for me. Like, they're just, they're too, <clears throat> it seems like this is the path it's going to be on. This is how it's going to happen. This is the outcome. It's like, you know, they're 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 heading in this direction unless something changes. It, it just, his, his conclusions are just too fatalistic. We'll leave it at that. As for inflation <clears throat> taming technologies, I do agree corporate adoption is prodigiously slow. Um, I don't know. Our inflation rate today, Canada, came in at 1.6%. 1.6% inflation. <clears throat> and we've had incredible population growth. Uh, over the last year, really good jobs report last week, 1.6%, 1, 1.6%. 1, 1 uh, in, um, I don't know how many mines now, you have uh, all the underground trucks are driving themselves. Well, you don't need workers for that, right? I mean, that's right right there, that, that cuts out costs. Uh, uh, so it's, um, yeah, I... I I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer this one by carving out a country and, and, and saying, but what about this country? Technology now is global. We have internet. We have iPhones. We have AI. We have, uh, uh, we, we, we have Google. We have, um, you know, we have the cloud. We have, um, you know, uh, fiber. We have high speed. I mean, so, yeah, I... I don't know that we're we're left behind in all this. We may not be the creators of the technology that we consume, but we certainly consume the technology. Uh, JS JPST considered by uh, as cash. No, no, only only um, actual securities that have a ninety day or less maturity not a perpetual portfolio of securities that are money market securities. It must be the money market security itself. <clears throat> Should we only trade the amount we are willing to lose? Yeah, I think that's that's an easy one, right? How to learn and understand anything effectively and quickly? Well, <laughs> uh, you, you pick one. Effectively or quickly? You pick one. You can't have both. Just give a short answer if you think it's a long answer. I just did. Pick one. You want to learn it effectively or do you want to learn it quickly? If you can learn it quickly, you can take effectively off the table. I think I think with that, you have your answer, right? Will you recommend to use chat B, G, B, G to learn? No. What are the qualities of a high-performing employee according to you as an employer? Oh, I don't think you need me to answer that. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can list what those qualities are, right? I mean, I, I don't think you need me to answer to answer that I look closely at US energy companies adjacent to renewable fuel standards in the California local okay well no that's way that's really specific no nope. no nope. we'll just uh, scroll on I, I I wouldn't get the rest of it anyways data science for investment professional certificate from CFAI not really first foray into the field of data analytics machine learning so do you think this would be a good place to start no idea no idea. I've stayed in the CFA lane. I know they introduce other things. <clears throat> I don't look at these other things. I never once considered the ESG certificate or, or, or thinking about teaching it. I 
I'm my plate is full uh, with what I do now that I, I don't have time to even look up from my uh, uh, from my work to look at what other things are I, I don't know anything about this one do you play options on XLU yes yes how come CPI month over month is so different to PPI month over month I thought since uh, they are two legs of the same process, the movement price should be similar. <clears throat> it cannot be due to taxes, right? Well, it's not just due to taxes. It's due to who pays. So uh, here's the uh, retail desk. Here's the consumer. Here's the producer. The consumer comes in and pays. The producer receives the money. That is measured. That is measured. It should, it should basically, any increase in price should basically be the same thing. But sometimes it's not the consumer that comes in, it's insurance company that comes in and pays. That's not counted in CPI, but it's counted in PPI, right? PPI is whatever the producer receives from whoever pays for it. CPI is whatever the consumer and only the consumer pays for. Consumer buys auto insurance. Auto insurance buys auto repair, right? So uh, that gets measured uh, from the insurance company. But from the consumer, only the payment for insurance gets measured. <clears throat> now, uh, there are auto repairs going on outside of insurance, but you know what I mean. If you uh, uh, hit your car, most if you go to an auto body repair shop, you would find that about 90% of the revenue is insurance paid. Uh, but if you go to a brake shop, you'd probably find that 90% of it is consumer paid. <clears throat> Hmm. How do you like long calls on TLT with a strike of 105 expiring in mid-January? Too soon. January is not long enough uh, to get to 105. So, no, I, I don't. I wouldn't do it. Everyone says you should diversify your assets, like buy different stocks. But how much should one diversify? Is there any rule? Nope. There are no rules. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. I don't think that you can manage more than 15 names. Uh, you can't possibly know. 40 names that's it's just way too much uh and if you have 40 names i can pretty much guarantee you you probably have five or six of them that have the exact same uh, uh risk factors in other words you're exposed to this to the same single risk factor <clears throat> so uh, you probably have a lot of highly correlated stocks you know it's like well i'm long for gm and chrysler wow that's a lot in one sector right i mean you know so, yeah, I think it would be hard to manage 40, 50 stocks um, <clears throat> actively. Is there no right or wrong thing in the market or, of finance? As you said, someone with concentration will say diversification. Yeah, it depends on what your skill set is, right? Depends on, on what your skill set is. <clears throat> I go to the gym. I lift weights a certain way. Somebody comes along and says, well, I don't do it that way. Yeah, but you don't have the same goals I have. You're not the same age I am, right? You don't have the same amount of time that I have. So <clears throat> it's whatever's right for you. Can we have any generalization, anything related to finance market? Sure, lots of generalizations, generalizations, sure. But, uh, you know, for me to start listing them off, uh, I'm not going to do that. 2008 crisis, did you see the crisis coming? Did you incur any losses? Uh, as I recall, I was short, so I lost going into the crisis because the market just kept going up. I remember I was on a ski hill New Year's Eve, and I'm looking, and you know, it was the day before uh, New Year's Eve night. I was on the ski hill. I kept looking, check, and I had a BlackBerry then. I kept checking and going, why is the market still going up? What, like, why? And then once we got into the new year, it was straight down. So, um... I did okay that year. I can't remember what I did the year before, though. When you say put money in market, does it mean putting money in an index fund? No, no, just, you know, and, and the market is just one big term. It's like saying, you know, go to the mall. The mall is not a, 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 a place. It's a collection of a bunch of stores. <clears throat> so the market is just a collection of a bunch of securities. Just landed a position, fully discretionary prop trader. Oof, after working as an alternative investment consultant for two years, any advice on excelling in this role? Well, it's a prop trader, right? So, um, <laughs> lots of turnover in prop, on prop desks. Lots of turnover on prop desks. 
I, I don't know that I have any good <laughs> any good advice. I'm scheduled for CFA Level 3 exam in February. In this new role, I'm debating whether to postpone Level 3 to the, for the future. What would you recommend? I'd recommend doing what you feel is right for you. I know, I know that get, kind of gets to be a tiring answer, but I don't know you. I know nothing about you. Uh, I know nothing about this job. I know nothing about uh, how much time it's going to take or, or, or what I mean. I know nothing. So I think you know what you want to do. You're looking for permission to do it. So I would say <clears throat> you should always do what's right for you. Uh, what would you recommend? Assuming I could manage the material and considering the opportunity cost involved. Yeah. I don't know. What's your reason for shorting SPY shares? <clears throat> it gives me U.S. dollars today, of which I uh, earn a return on. Uh, and I need U.S. dollars anyways. So rather than convert any uh, other currency to U.S. dollars, since I'm going to be short the market, why not manufacture my own U.S. dollars that I need and short SPY? Which data are you using for OAS spreads? Where can I find it? <clears throat> you can find it on Fred. Like you can say um, OAS... A A A Fred and Fred will give it to you or you can go to Coifin Coifin.com and you can get uh, OAS's there is a crude interest priced into T-bill at time of selling uh, a T-bill is sold at a discount so uh, there is a maturity there is a par 100% and it is sold at a discount and it just simply gets uh, pulled to par every single day so yes the accrued interest is in the price at any given time sell so t-bill prior to maturity am I still getting the interest for holding a t-bill yep yep <clears throat> fault with the Canadian report is that population grew by 110 K month over month and 1.176 year over year our immigration numbers are out of control. Okay. Maybe market is discounting now another wave of inflation and even rates go even higher. Yeah, well, sure. Maybe they don't. <clears throat> Maybe it just goes sideways. Maybe it goes up. Maybe it goes down. The future is unknowable. But man, is it going to be exciting, right? What's it going to do? Uh, sure, all of that is all of that is possible. You don't know, I don't know, nobody knows what's going to happen. All you can do is, is say, well, I think this. And if I think this, this makes sense for me to do. That's all you can do. And that doesn't mean that everybody thinks the same thing. There's some people who think, no, 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 inflation is coming back with a vengeance. Other people are saying, no, nah, this is about the best it's going to get on inflation. Other people saying, no, no, disinflation will be the problem. All smart people. You know, all with credentials to back them up. Well, they all can't happen, right? Of those three different groups, two of them are going to be wrong. That's that's about as best as you, the best you're going to get in the market. Is that at any given time, probably half the people out there are going to be wrong in what they say in the direction on the market, on the direction of anything, on the direction of any economic indicator. And given enough time, almost 100% of the people will be wrong at least 10 to 20% of the time. That's a market. That's a market. Um, not talking about Tesla. Don't care about it. But I keep hearing you and people say that Uber will be the winner in autonomy. I never said they'll be the winner in autonomy. I said they, they will be the platform. Trying to wrap my head around that Uber it, it itself isn't solving autonomy. They don't have to. From what I can see, they're in the business of connecting drivers with riders. Yep, they're a platform. If ABC, a company ABC solves autonomy, wouldn't it just make sense for that company to have their own app? Why? Might be slightly worse app than Uber's, but I think building that app would be more profitable than giving a slice of your own profits to Uber. Why? Like giving a slice of your own profits. <clears throat> Um, building your own app has huge overhead. So you're just giving a slice of your profits to Amazon and to all your staff and to the place where you got to house all your staff and all of the, and you're giving a slice of your profits to Apple or Microsoft and to all the SaaS services that you need. 
You're giving a slice of your profits uh, to, to, to somebody somewhere. You'll always be giving a slice of it to somebody somewhere, right? But why reinvent what's already been done? Uh, so, no, it's... Uh, what are the actual competitive advantages Uber would have? Let's say Waymo crew. Oh, I already answered this. Uh, <clears throat> Uber has scale. Uber has top of mind awareness. Uber has 140 million people with the app already on their phone, with the credit card information already in. Uh, some people pay uh, a monthly fee for Uber and they get a discount on the rides they get. It's, it's, it's the mall. It is the mall. You know, you can be in the big mall. If you're a retailer, you could be in the big mall, but then you'd say, but why would I give a slice of my profits to the mall when I could just set up my own store? Well, that's still going to cost you, and you don't have their traffic flow. you got to now advertise to get traffic flow. So now you have customer acquisition costs. Uber's already done that. Scale, man. you got scale. Uh, why would you want to be anywhere else? Right? <clears throat> Technological advancements, increased productivity, and in turn increased real GDP growth rate. However, wouldn't this in most cases be a temporary increase to the real growth rate? No, not if technology continues. The pace of technology continues. Technology doesn't just happen and then, okay, everyone go home. We're done. It continues. I can't see how technological advancement adds infinite non-inflation inducing growth. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> let's just take farming, for example. And if you look at the yield per acre, and you go back to 1850, and you go to 2020, there was a guy way back then called Malthus, M-A-L-T-H-U-S. And he said uh, that their population cannot grow indefinitely because the land, given the yields on the land, cannot support it. So population will grow until everybody's poor and hungry. That was his future. Till everyone's poor and hungry. What he didn't see was productivity after productivity after productivity after, and the productivity of the land is still increasing. What are we doing now? We're changing the seed itself to be more resilient so that it grows more and more. <clears throat> Where's the limit? Where, where does it end? If you can uh, uh, change the, uh, the plant seed such that it grows, instead of uh, six feet tall with uh, four ears of corn, it grows 12 feet tall with eight ears of corn. Now you've doubled the, the, the yield on one acre of land, right? So no, it, it, it has not stopped. If you look at the yield per acre, just in something like farming, it has not stopped. Uh, and it will continue to grow. Yeah, it will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. Uh, look at uh, the size of a processor, the 8086, right? Uh, didn't do very much, didn't have that many calculations, but at the time it was incredible and it was $5,000 to buy a computer with an 8086. Today, if you found one with an 8086, it'd be five bucks. You'd buy it as a trinket, as a, as a, a, a you know, uh, something to remember. The processors today are, what, a uh, thousand times faster, if not more. And the prices are, uh, what, 1,500, 1,000? This way back then would have been five, uh, maybe 50 million to build a computer that powerful. Uh, and that will continue on. Uh, if you say, but the price of the car today is way more than the price of a car, you know, 50 years ago, where's the deflation? Yeah, but take all of the technology in the car today and bring it back 50 years. What would that car have cost 50 years ago with that technology? First of all, it didn't exist. But if, you, if it did exist, it would be millions of dollars because it would be this massive prototype that you've created. So you have to also look at how the uh, uh, quality and the features of something have improved over time. So when we say it's deflationary, that doesn't always mean prices go down. Prices can still go up, but the bundle of, of value that you're receiving is cheaper than it would have been two years ago had you gotten that bundle of goods. Uh, there is no end. There, there is no end. It doesn't end, right? Uh, look, we, we, we are now at uh, two nanometers. One point, actually 1.8. If you look at what IBM is trying to get done, uh, 1.8 nanometers on on uh, on a wafer, 1.8. That is super small, and it'll 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 keep decreasing. Speeds will keep increasing. 
capacity will keep increasing. Um, yeah, no, it, uh, it, 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 it's not going to slow down. There is no end. There is no end. <laughs> I'm not sure if you had a chance to get Jamie Dimon's recent interview with Bloomberg. <clears throat> Parts of it is expectations for long into the yield curve, suggesting that rates are likely to remain elevated or tick higher in the U.S. Reasoning was tied to higher long-term inflation driven by persistent fiscal deficits. That's not going to do it. Transition to green energy. Why would green energy do that? Demographic shifts. Mm, I'm not seeing that on demographic shifts either. <clears throat> Do you agree with this assessment or do you see other fact? Well, I mean, I don't agree with this assessment because I think the, the end game for rates are lower. Persistent fiscal deficits will, will create a situation where the debt is so large you have no choice but to go to the zero line or, or bankrupt the country or, or, or take so much of the tax revenue to pay the interest, uh, to pay the interest on the debt, so much of the tax revenue to pay that. So I'm not seeing how point number one leads to higher uh, long-term, higher long-term yields. Uh, and again, uh, the market will not demand higher long-term yields unless there is a feeling uh, that uh, the um, the credit uh, quality of uh, the issuer is not just going to go down, but that 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 the ability to pay it back comes into question. Uh, there is never a problem with too much debt. It's always in paying it back where you get the problem. So look at Japan. <clears throat> if 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 200% debt GDP didn't create higher rates, if 220% didn't create higher rates, if 240% didn't create higher rates, for the second at the time, second largest economy, why do you think it's going to do it for the largest economy? Right? No, I don't think so. I don't understand why the transition to green energy is <clears throat> is going to lead to higher rates. I don't get that. No, I don't. Uh, I, I disagree. Uh, would your levels of duration change on Tesla puts if Elon Musk becomes a part of the Trump cabinet? Nope, nope, because you'd have a more distracted CEO uh, become a bigger short, given that he may be able to swing subsidies his way. Uh, not without Congress. Not, not without Congress. It's weird to see break-even rates go up and and, and, and real still low. <clears throat> Market losing confidence. Fed contained long-term inflation. Uh, I, I don't know that I would read too much into one thing. Uh, nothing ever does this and nothing ever does this. It does this. Right, so we had this for a while. Now we're over here on inflation. Nothing ever does this, and nothing ever does this. It does this kind of thing, right? It 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 does that. Nothing ever goes in a straight line. So, <clears throat> responding to every little tick in the in 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 the trend, you know, it's 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 just noise. So uh, no, I uh, I I don't think. I don't think that's what's going on. Shelter prices will come down with lower rates because more houses will hit the market and increased supply will solve the problem. Always solves the problem. Long-term rates have gone down recently along with mortgage rates. Mortgage rates are still over 6%. <clears throat> no improvement in shelter inflation. Well, you got to get mortgage rates much lower than 6 6.1%, 6.2%. A lot of mortgage holders in the U.S. have have a locked in mortgage rates of three percent or lower. They're not budging. They're not budging. Um, and long term rates have not come down enough. Uh, mortgage rates have not come down enough. <clears throat> Maybe we should wait for housing market to crash. Won't crash, and some people will be forced to sell a house and increase supply. It won't crash. It it, it there's a structural shortage. It it won't crash. It crashed in 2008 because there was a structural surplus. It won't crash now. There has to be some pain in solving this problem. Mm. I share your views on Tesla. wonder if the assumptions about Tesla are correct. What could trigger the stock to go down? <laughs> Hard to tell. <clears throat> Tesla doesn't have shareholders. It has fans. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. 
What was uh, Bloomberg even had a story today about the robots not controlling themselves? This has been all weekend long. We've heard this, and Bloomberg reports it. And Tesla was green today. It was green. Any other company, uh, a scandal like that, that they cheated and lied, would send that stock straight down. Any other company. But no, no, because there is a group of people who believe, and there's another group of people who tell that group of people they're right. ARK is a good one. ARK doesn't, doesn't believe its price target. ARK doesn't believe anything along those lines. I firmly believe that. But ARK knows that there's a bunch of people who want to hear that and that will make the stock go up or at least find support for the stock. So they tell them exactly what they want to hear. They lie to people who want to be lied to. <clears throat> this is what you have. It makes it it makes it a hard stock to short because of this, because its price is a reflection of the willingness of the shareholder to believe and not the fundamental value of the company. Sure, the upcoming earnings could disappoint, but Tesla had bad earnings before and that did not cause the stock to be valued as a normal car company. <clears throat> what has to happen to make the stock viewed as a normal car company? Uh, the fan base has to finally give up <clears throat> and say, oh, well, enough is enough. Or the fundamentals have to become so clear that you can't, that, that there's nothing you can do about it. The fundamentals have to become so clear. <clears throat> Oil prices are based on supply and demand. One could argue that given Trump's interest in investing in energy, oil prices will drop given the increase in supply and oil companies will profit less. That's assuming they don't blow around. Blittering Iran's nuclear terminal and in general a war in Iran will cause a mass migration of people and I don't think the EU would like to entertain such an event. Uh, mm, mm, uh, Iran is a little bit different. I don't know that, I mean, are you getting out of that country? Uh, would, there, would, would mass migration out be allowed? <clears throat> I don't know. Is there a way or subscription service to follow your trades and portfolio besides studying CFA? As much as I would like to study, full-time job leaves me a little time. Not at this point. I was going to uh, make it a um, a recurring paid module, but uh, I, I don't know that I'm going to. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have an answer for that one just now. Applied level going through the course of financial modeling, I have a question, how to know about the sector? Is it wise to read like four to five, 10 Ks? No, you just got to read one, maybe two, but uh, not four to five. Uh, better grasp the sector. Um, I don't know that there's, uh, like some, some sectors are really easy to understand. You know, you've been to a Costco, what do they sell? Food and stuff. It's really easy to understand, right? That's going to be driven a lot by economic growth. But Costco has a more affluent customer uh, and a very loyal customer. So even during recessions, it's more than likely uh, that most of its customer base are not the ones that get laid off. Uh, most, not all, but most. Um, and even if they did, they'd still need a place to shop. Costco still is the cheaper place to shop it's questionable whether or not they'd give up their membership. So it's it's not a difficult business to figure out. Uh, so I don't know that you have to do spend a lot of time figuring out the sector or the sub industry that cost goes in because you use it, you use it a lot. You use these type of stores a lot. You understand the driver uh, of of spending money in these stores because you spend money in these stores. <clears throat> No, I don't know that uh, I would read that many 10Ks. I don't think you have to. Man, you were way off with your market predictions this year, huh? Uh, I didn't make market predictions this year. Uh, way off. I was about 90% right on almost everything that I, that I picked this year. Go back to January and, uh, I mean, I stated my positions every week until mid-August. And if or end of July, I think, 
And if you make a note of what I was talking about and then watched, you know, looked at a chart at that time, I was about 90% right. So I don't know what you mean unless you're just somebody who doesn't like me. Probably have some scarring from 2000, 2008. No. Not this time is not like those. Not this time is not like those. I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know what the hell you're talking about off of my market predictions. I didn't make a market prediction this year. I specifically said many times when I was asked, where's the S&P going to be this year? I don't know. <laughs> Beats the hell out of me. Could be higher, could be lower. I don't know. Um, my short position on uh, the market, and we can say, well, that hasn't worked out. It's worked out great. Yeah, the market has gone up. But when you're short, as I said many times, you have to be tactical. You have to trade in and around it. You have to use the options. If I uh, run a report, which I did for September 30th, and I look at uh, my position, my realized gains on MES, ES, and SPY, and I match it off against the position I have, I'm positive. Now, a lot of those trades I would not have done if I wasn't short. The other thing that being short allowed me to do is extend my long positions and sleep at night. So that if I wanted to add on a certain amount of dollar beta on a long position that I thought would do better than the market, I took the same amount in a short position on the market, which means I'm taking beta out of the picture and just looking for alpha. I wouldn't have done these long extensions if I wasn't short. So you could say, well, it worked out great. So you have to, you know, I, I, I imagine... Based on your comment, you're the kind of person that looks at, uh, uh, you know, what somebody did and you say, oh, that didn't work out. Oh, you loser. That didn't work out. <laughs> and you just ignore all the other stuff. I don't know why you'd make a comment like that. Um, you know, how you doing? Right. Let's uh, let's uh, let's bring that up. Usually comments like this uh, are not are not. Um, from people who are doing really well because they have very little time to be bitter. Uh, it usually comes from somebody who's not doing well in life. So they make themselves feel better uh, by attempting uh, to point out how other people are not, are not doing well. But you're way off on that one, man. Don't even know why you'd make a comment like that. Like, what, what, what are you hoping to achieve with that? Right. Uh, other other than come across as an asshole, what do you what do you hope to achieve by talking like this? I want you to think about that. I really do want you to think about this. You may have an opinion, but what do you hope to achieve with this? Right. I don't know. Anyways, can we skip Canadian data? U.S. batters a tad bit more. Yeah, yeah, it does, but. Uh, YouTube tells me that uh, I think it's like 40% of my viewers are Canadian, so 40% of them are going, what did he just say, eh? Is he talking about us, eh? So, you know, watch it. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for this week.